Hello, everyone. This is Ian from Unincorporated, and I want to welcome you yet again to another episode of the Higher Ed Happy Hour. Today, I'm here with Tom Vander Ark. Tom is the CEO of a company called Getting Smart, where he advises schools and founders. Uh, excuse me. Tom is the CEO of Getting Smart, where he advises schools and foundations on how to accelerate innovations in learning that empower all people, not just a particular group. That is so important. Tom is also an author of numerous books, and previously he served as the executive director of education for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And prior to that, he was a public school superintendent at Washington State. Previously, Tom served as the executive director of education for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And prior to that, he was a school public super. Oh, my goodness. I'm so sorry. It's late in the afternoon. Let's try that one more time. Previously, Tom had served as the previously Tom served as the executive director of education for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And prior to that, he was a public school superintendent in Washington state. He's here with us today to discuss real world learning in this modern age and his quote, new pathways campaign, which is a roadmap for American schools with a very ambitious vision for the future of education. And as a thought leader in the educational space, we want to know all about Tom's ambitious vision of education. I tell you, that's quite a resume, Tom. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Ian. It's great to be with you. Thank you. Let's get started. Just high level, kind of work our way from there. But why don't you tell us just a little bit about your background, You know how you went from being a superintendent to the executive director of education at the Gates Foundation to ultimately becoming the CEO of your company, Getting Smart? Well, Ian, I should probably go in, in the Wayback Machine um, and tell your audience that I'm an engineer by original training, a mining engineer from Colorado School Mines, um, worked in the extractive industries for six years, have an advanced degree in, uh, in energy finance uh, from the University of Denver, uh, and taught at uh, both DU and Regis in the in the business school for many years while I was a private sector executive in both technology uh, and retail. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had the opportunity to become a public school superintendent. So I was one of the first uh, business executives uh, recruited to lead a school district. Washington State was one of the first to waive the traditional licensure. Um, and invited a couple um, very unprepared <laughs> young people like me to attempt to be a, a public school superintendent. Um, I, I had the privilege of serving uh, my community here, Federal Way, Washington, as superintendent for five years and uh, quickly realized that I was on some dimensions the best prepared superintendent in the country. I knew a lot about leading large organizations and uh, developing uh, thoughtful budgets and deploying new technology. Um, but I really didn't know uh, much at all about K-12 education. And I, I quickly found out that while um, the need to create a, a focused agenda and a positive culture is is important in any organization. I learned that in education, the people, politics, and economics are very different than the than the private sector. Um, but my my experience as a as superintendent led to uh, an early relationship with uh, Bill and Melinda Gates. Um, I I early in my uh, tenure helped develop a, a technology training program that we shared with all the uh, principals across the state of Washington. And then uh, I was able to help them stand up their foundation in 1999 uh, and spent most of the first decade there leading uh, education. So, Ian, it was a, sort of a non traditional path into philanthropy. Um, I'm proud and pleased to have been able to serve as a public school superintendent, but only did it long enough to know how challenging it is. Yeah. Well, it's fascinating. You don't hear every day of one going between the different 
spheres or think of them maybe as modalities <laughs> within the uh, the landscape of of education you know going from the public education sector to you know having worked within the private sector and, and working for industry and enterprise to supporting a foundation. Um, that's, that's quite a blend of experience and you've somehow managed to successfully transition in between each of those ecosystems or each of those modalities. How did you ultimately then land with the, the company getting smart now? And I'm referring to it as a company, but maybe you refer to it more as an organization or an advisory board how did you how did you ultimately form getting smart um we we are a, a hybrid organization we're we're both a company and a nonprofit. Um, my wife and daughter founded the uh the organization almost 15 years ago while i was after i left the gates foundation i i i led the xprize foundation for a few years and uh, learned a lot about price philanthropy um and then I launched, uh, helped launch the, the first EdTech Venture Fund. Um, and uh, while I was doing that, my wife launched uh, Getting Smart, which um, supported uh, initially the, the EdTech community uh, with a, a focus on, uh, on supporting education entrepreneurs. Um, after about five years in, um, Venture investing. I uh, joined my wife and uh, daughter, and and for the last ten years, we've been active in advising education innovators, whether they're uh, school districts or colleges and universities uh, or edtech startups. Uh, and a, an important part of our work that complements that is that we've stood up campaigns around emerging issues that attempt to help educators. Um, understand the, the path forward. So in both of our work, uh, advising and advocating, we have really tried to support that, uh, that path forward in learning. Yeah. So thinking about innovations in education and, you know, helping address some of the main, main challenges within higher ed, you have this new pathways campaign. Tell us about that and how that seeks to both bring in or, or leverage innovations in education as, as well as the challenges that it currently addresses? Ian, I, uh, as I got to know Bill Gates um, back in the 90s, uh, one, one thing that I most appreciated about him is he said, Tom, I, I want to work on the hardest thing that we could possibly take on. I want to try something that um, that no one else could or would take on. And uh, for that reason, I invited him to uh, to take on the high school challenge in America. We, we have about 25,000 high schools and, and most remain quite traditional in structure and focus. Um, and when we started uh, this work back in the 90s, our national graduation rate was about 66% and we lied about it and we reported the number of seniors that graduated, but we never really tracked uh, how many students made it through high school, much less through uh, uh, post-secondary. And uh, Ian, I, I guess to this day, I remain um, focused on that challenge of trying to make secondary education much better and, and try to dramatically increase the number of students um, well prepared for post-secondary success. Um, and so while we accomplished a lot at the Gates Foundation, we helped start about 1,200 new high schools that remain um, very good today and, and build a 50-state graduation rate compact that uh, with new and approved schools led to a dramatic increase in American graduation rates from about 66% to closer to 90% today. Uh, there's a lot of work to do to help more kids enter a, a pathway, one that is purposeful, that uh, is, is a, leans into a student's strengths and interests, but it's also connected to the needs of their community. So 
a path that's purposeful and uh, supported and efficient. So uh, our, our campaign is really about helping secondary and post-secondary institutions create uh, these purposeful, sequential, often accelerated experiences uh, linked to opportunity. And how did you find this passion, this driving force along the way? Was it because of the initial design challenge that that Bill gave you, Tom, or was there something else that was that was driving you earlier on? Well, Ian, that's, you reminded me of a story that I don't get to tell very often. But uh, in my last year as a superintendent, my daughter graduated, and I um, I had. We had just started the Gates Foundation, so I was sitting in the audience instead of sitting on the stage where I'd been the prior five years. And as the scholars uh, marched into the uh, the Tacoma Dome, um, I, I counted in the program how many students there were because they didn't seem like there were uh, enough. And I, I only counted 400, and I knew that we had sent 600 students to that high school and so sitting there on what would in what should have been the happiest day of my life, I thought about what happened to the other 200 students that on my watch didn't make it to graduation. And it, it was that experience as much as anything else that is really a conviction in my life to try to help more young people reach a high school graduation and, and then initiate a, a, a meaningful, a purposeful and affordable um, post-secondary uh, career linked to, to opportunity. So in that respect, Ian, I think this work is, is really uh, personal for me. Yeah, I, I have this great vivid image of, of you sitting there and like you say, what should have been your happiest moment actually being the moment where you realize, holy, holy cow, my work isn't done. It's just actually just beginning. And that, right. uh, that spark no, I'm was sitting, alive I'm and well. sitting there, my, my, my wife's elbowing me like, what's the matter? And I'm like, well, I just did the mental math and there were 10,000 yeah. kids on my watch, not well served by the schools I was responsible to support. And so it, it's that sense that we, we, we just have to do better in America at putting more kids, inviting more kids into creating or finding a, a meaningful path to, to contribution. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think the, the purpose, the driving force, the, the big reason why is clear uh, in terms of the, the what, you know, what new pathways campaign does. This is what you read on your website. It says, I quote, uh, it's a campaign that is a roadmap for American schools where every learner, regardless of a zip code, is on, or regardless of zip code, is on a pathway to productive citizenship, high wage employment, and economic mobility, and a purpose-driven life, which is something we all deeply desire at the core. So that's that. That's what it is. Now, how how do you implement this? Is it yeah. you know? on campus at these high schools are these other high schools that you're setting up like what's the what's the way that that you actually deliver on this vision and this mission that you have here really in, in two ways Ian. one one is uh, a, an information campaign where we're describing new learning strategies and then secondly um, in in regional partnerships with uh, a, a number of foundations we we actually get to do work on the ground, um, helping uh, school districts support these ideas. So uh, on the on the former, on the advocacy front, we're really interested in a number of themes. One is unbundled learning. And by that, we mean, particularly during the pandemic, just the number of learning options available to humans on the planet just really exploded and um, and we think in many cases, those new opportunities can be put to, to better use. They can be more purposefully um, found and integrated into learning pathways. And so the second category is for us is new learning models. We want to help take some of that unbundled learning and 
help schools and universities incorporate these new opportunities into new experiences and new uh, new learning journeys or or, uh, or or pathways. And number three, um, for about 150 years, we've relied on a list of courses and grades as the primary signaling mechanism, uh, and that just no longer works. It it is um, really insufficient to describe human capability. And so we think digital credentials, um, often writing in a, in a learner wallet, uh, offer a much richer opportunity to more comprehensively and accurately and, and in a trustworthy way, describe a set of human capabilities. So new models, uh, often measured and, and communicated in a new set of credentials. All of that has to be supported uh, with a, a new set of guidance systems that help learners um, thoughtfully co-author experiences and journeys. And this co-authoring is increasingly going to be the combination of a, an advisor and, a, and an algorithm. Uh, it, it'll be a, an advisor that walks alongside you in your secondary and post-secondary journey, supported by um, intelligent tools uh, that are that are not only smart about you and your needs, but also geo-smart about the learning uh, and contribution opportunities uh, in in your vicinity. And then the ecosystem is really systems and supports uh, that that make that possible. Um, in in K-12, it's a really interesting time in America where about a third of the states are launching these new direct-to-consumer funding models uh, where families and learners have brand new opportunities to um, either take advantage of existing learning alternatives or to create their own. And um, I think we'll see more and more of that in the post-secondary space as well. And so we're, we're interested in, um, in, in helping to guide those new opportunities in a, in a productive way. So those are a few of the themes of the campaign. And one, one quick example of where and how we're trying to uh, help enact new pathways on the ground is in uh, Metro Kansas City, where we have the, the privilege to support uh, about 85 school systems in both Kansas and Missouri with the support of the Kauffman Foundation. And all 85 of those um, high schools in, in 35 systems, I should say, are implementing real world learning and they're creating new pathways that include internships and work-based learning and client-connected projects and college credit opportunities, as well as industry uh, recognized credentials. And so all of those high schools are building new pathways connected to opportunity, um, often accelerated pathways uh, to and through college and, and to work. And so that's a, for us, a great example of a, a region that's building new pathways uh, in real time. That's a great example. So new pathways, if I heard you correctly, it is looking to leverage the unbundling of learning and making that uh, unbundling those opportunities more purposeful. You're looking at creating or leveraging new opportunities, new learning journeys or new pathways. I now see why you named it that way. Oh. And uh, in some places, augmenting or maybe even replacing the grading system with digital right. credentialing. Is that right? Yes. That's really, that's really great. It's a great program, great format. I'm wondering if a college wanted to bring new pathways to their programs, what would be the steps that they would take in order to do so? We are... Um... The, the Gates Foundation helped to launch the early college movement uh, 21 years ago now, and that resulted 
in about 300 of these early college high schools that blend high school and two years of college. Um, 10 years ago, IBM and New York City built on that initiative uh, with a motto called PTEC, and that takes an early college high school and adds high tech work experience uh, to it. And there's now about 300 PTECs um, around the world. Texas happens to be the, the leader in both early college and PTEC. They quickly developed a, a supportive set of policies uh, and now have more PTECs and early colleges than the rest of the country combined. And they are launching a new initiative to, uh, to double or triple uh, the number of those uh, dual enrollment institutions. And so that my first answer would be uh, to look for ways to be um, actively engaged in the, in the dual enrollment space. Um, I'm, I'm happy to report that there are um, more than 500 um, post-secondary institutions in, involved in, uh, in that space today. Um, it's hard for an R1 to step into that space, um, but we have seen productive examples of it. Um, Metro Early College in Columbus is on the uh, Ohio State campus and is a, a terrific uh, partnership. Um, UCSD in San Diego has a, a great early college on uh, campus. Um, Purdue University took a different approach and sponsored a network of high schools called Purdue Polytechnic High School uh, to build a, a more diverse um, enrollment base from Indianapolis, and they've had a, a beautiful um, partnership that includes but isn't limited to, to dual enrollment. So that'd be the first answer is to look for ways to get involved in, uh, in dual enrollment to create more accelerated and affordable pathways through post-secondary. Mm -hmm. and, and would these individuals reach out to you as an advisor to help implement that or, or source those opportunities? Uh, they, they certainly can. Um, we'd love to see um, university officials partner with their uh, local schools directly. Mm -hmm. um, some states make this much more attractive than others. I, I would say there's about a third of the states have really good uh, dual enrollment laws, where the funding is attractive to both the sending high school and the receiving college, and where there's good credit reciprocity so that a student's credit can travel across the state. And so this, this category of accelerated pathways is one where state law matters a lot, because uh, there's at least a third of the states that have terrible dual enrollment policies where students have to pay uh, for college credit and where there's not very good uh, credit reciprocity. And uh, so that in, in a few states, the first stop might not be your local high school. The first stop might be your state capital where you know, encourage uh, policy makers to make it easier to create accelerated pathways. Mm -hmm. Where does new pathways need help? Um, we're really interested in new learning models. Um, and so we, we would love to, uh, to learn from your audience about um, e examples of new learning models that are really connecting young people to opportunity. Um, I, I'll give you a couple examples. I'm, I'm really interested in rigorous, um, client-connected project-based learning. Um, it's easy to do project-based learning. It's hard to do it well. And uh, I mentioned Purdue Polytechnic High School. It's probably the best in the country at client-connected projects. And so they have worked both with uh, Purdue University and with uh, about 50 local employers to identify problems of practice in those businesses and to frame them up and to invite young people to 
engage with those businesses in developing uh, real-time solutions. Uh, but structuring those is really challenging and then building a sequence of those as the um, primary backbone of high school instead of going from class to class on a 50-minute schedule. If, if you really build a sequence of community-connected projects uh, and then build skill building around that, what you end up with is individualized schedules where every adult and every learner is on a, a unique schedule. So that's a that's a new kind of a structure uh, that Purdue Polytechnic is is piloting. And so we'd love to learn about models like that, that connect students with work that matters. We love to uh, learn about ways that high schools and colleges are working together uh, in productive ways. Um, one thing we may dive into um, further in our conversation is that we see in higher education is the move to lifelong learning uh, and, and higher ed being increasingly viewed as uh, instead of a four-year degree or whatever it is, a six-year degree, um, a lifetime of learning, um, but often taken on in short chunks around specific uh, credentials. And we're excited to see more and more of that happening where higher ed is becoming more modular, uh, more learner-centered, more linked to opportunity, and, and often um, credentialed or certificated um, in ways that might stack into degrees, but uh, shorter chunks that are linked to specific um, contribution opportunities. And, um, and some of these can be entered while in high school. Um, and so the, the potential for these blended institutions that are often earn and learn ladders where a student um, might be working and learning um, at the same time, sometimes with the employer subsidizing uh, that learning, uh, learning journey. We think those kind of learning models are really interested. And um, so we'd, we'd love to hear from any of your listeners that are engaged in or know of interesting models that are engaging uh, particularly young people in new and powerful ways. Um, so new experiences, new structures, new uh, business models behind them, new signaling systems like credentials around them. We think all of those are, uh, are really interesting and would love to, to help get the word out on um, the good work that's being done around the country. That's a great call to action. So those listening, you heard it here first, reach out and please share what you're up to in terms of new learning models. I love this, this phrase, this catchphrase that you left us with the earn and learn ladders <laughs> that are out there. That's great. It's the first time I had heard that we've had some experience with uh, ripen that touts to be the number one work-based learning platform. So that connects learners with employers and educators. Are you familiar with them? Sure. Yeah. So they've, um, we've done a handful of projects with them and then HubSpot, their educational partner program has also been a great way to bring in yeah. some of these opportunities into, into class. They're terrific. And, um, and in K-12 Transio, uh, and Emblaze, emblaze.org and transio.com are great examples of uh, work-based learning platforms that make it easier to find, secure, and manage uh, work-based learning experience. Excellent. Excellent. So I heard you say a few answers to this question already. You mentioned that higher education can become or is becoming lifelong learning taken in short chunks as credentials that higher ed can be more modular, more learning centered. I see that as really hyper personalization. So making the, de the degree tracks or the majors and minors personalized to the learner and to uh, each learner at the individual level. What else 
would you include in the ideal picture of higher ed? What what is your ideal picture of higher ed in addition to those yeah. attributes? Well, um, even college graduates should be employable. So I, I think uh, career education and exploration from day one, you know, as part of the orientation, even before as part of the enrollment, uh, I, I think I'm, I'm really great grateful to see this becoming a real priority at most college campuses today. And while I agree with my, my uh, friends and colleagues in the liberal arts that in some respects, the liberal arts are more important than ever, it is more important than ever that in including the liberal arts uh, colleges that every student enrolled in a liberal arts program must be in a career development and career exploration um, pathway where they're thinking about their um, employment during college and after college. Uh, and liberal arts can and will be valuable if and only when there's a, a path to employment um, as, as part of that. Uh, so I would love to see more of that. And, and in K-12, by the way, we're trying to push um, career education all the way down to elementary school. We think that starting even in the primary grades with uh, a, a vocational identity, beginning to understand your own strengths and interests and how those match up with possible futures uh, is a conversation that we can and should start early. Uh, but I think it has to be a, a daily part of every college student's uh, experience. What would you say to the critic that says that the market factor, the market force around career job outcomes is too limiting or is too heavy handed or in some ways impedes and gets in the way of education and exploration? I, I think the market has uh, spoken on this issue. I, I think the current enrollment numbers um, make it really clear that uh, uh, America has just said no to um, expensive degrees that don't have good employment outcomes. Um, and I don't think colleges will be open for long if they don't take the employment um, mandate seriously. Yeah, that's a great answer. It, it is still a spectrum though, right? Like you can't go fully into the career side of the equation. Is that is that fair? As I said, you know, I value the liberal arts and the, the knowledge and skills and dispositions that you develop in the liberal arts, but the vast majority of learners and families can no longer enter into liberal arts absent um, a, a parallel track of um, building a vocational identity, developing uh, work-based learning experiences and improving one's uh, employability. Yeah, I, I will add. I'll add to this whole discussion that the the one thing that's new and different about career, about identity development and career exploration, is the subject of entrepreneurship. This is becoming much, much more important. And and I would say to date that ninety nine percent of our career exploration and workforce development efforts have focused on getting a job. I think we need an equal emphasis on making a job and inviting learners to think about themselves as an employer, not just an employee, because almost every young person is, is going to lead some kind of a portfolio life where they are um, an employer in one uh, aspect and an employee in another aspect where they're part of the, um, the gig economy, uh, while they're pursuing a side hustle, while they're an employee. And so they'll be going back and forth in, in terms of emphasis of whether they're 
an entrepreneur or an employee. And even in the employment field, um, what has become more and more valued is the ability to spot opportunity and to take initiative. This is uh, what I so appreciate about um, the Keen Network in higher education. It's 50 of the best engineering schools in the country that share a commitment to teaching entrepreneurial mindset to engineers. And they teach opportunity spotting, um, solution designing, and impact delivery. And, and I think that's a, a beautiful way to incorporate entrepreneurial mindset across the curriculum. And so in that sense, it's not thinking about engineering and, and career development as something separate. It is incorporating entrepreneurship into the way we think about um, and teach uh, engineering. Yeah. Again, you've left us, I think, with a, a really good paradigm shift to reflect on, which is the process of emphasizing making a job, not just getting a job. I, I heard recently that as, as uncomfortable as the great resignation has been <laughs> for many employers, we haven't even reached the point at which there's going to be the great never even applied for a job <laughs> reality yeah for employers. So I think you're ahead of the curve on that, that idea. I, I still wrestle with the arts and culture as a, as a way to still open up yeah. market opportunities. And of course the, uh, the, on the supply side, um, how to meet maybe a demand that isn't there that you can't necessarily manufacture. Yeah. So no, I, uh, I appreciate that. And I, let, let me just say that I, um, I would love to see every secondary student and most post-secondary students experience success in the arts prior to graduation. When we think about new pathways, we really want to think not about preparing students for what's next. We want them to experience success in the world of work, um, in college, in the arts and in civics. And we want them to experience that success in, in high school. What I, I think we can do better is in the way that we teach human expression, including but not limited to performing arts, is that we can teach expression and entrepreneurship together so that we can invite learners to think about how they can express ideas that are important to them and their community and do it in a way that is scalable and sustainable. That might be via a, uh, a social impact campaign, or it might be versus uh, through a business model, but it's inviting learners to think synthetically about not only the expression, but the way that expression is delivered as a, as a social change mechanism. And that really combines this idea of expression and entrepreneurship um, and I, I think we can do a better job of teaching that in, in both secondary and post-secondary. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit more about technology, especially as we're having this discussion and open AI is continuing to increase its user base. And, and I think I read recently that now the plan is to scan every eye eyeball <laughs> so that there's a crypto wallet attached to everyone's identity. Um, how do you how do you see technology impacting education here in the in the near future? I I wrote a book length answer to that in <laughs> in uh, 2011, and I'm working. So we'll have on, to hyperlink to that one, I guess. <laughs> uh, that was called Getting Smart, and that's actually where the name of our firm came from. Um, I. For, for the Hoover Institution, I, I'm trying to write a 10-page answer to this question right now that is both the history of EdTech, whether it's had any benefit or not, and the future of EdTech, and, and trying to do that in 10 pages is, is challenging. Um, so, so let me say that um, as a tech optimist, um, I, I heard on a podcast this morning that the business sector 
that I was part of is, has been trying to deploy technology thoughtfully for for 40 years and in most cases is still looking for a real return on investment. That's certainly true in education. If I think back at the money that we've spent um, going one-to-one -one, um, in attempting to personalize learning um, over the last 30 years, it's if you look at traditional outcome measures, reading and math scores in particular, you can't see a return on investment. I, I to do me. think it, it's, um, it's disheartening. I, I do think for many learners, uh, technology has helped improve other outcomes that were less uh, able to uh, track and report on. Um, but overall, it's hard to say that we've had anything close to a, a satisfactory return on investment. And it, it, in some respects, it the, the goalposts keep moving, which makes this an interesting exercise. You know, in, in 2019, I and, and a number of other edtech advocates were celebrating the fact that we had just, we'd basically achieved one-to-one -one, um, status in U.S. education, particularly in secondary education, where there were enough devices for every kid and just about every secondary school in America was, was wired. And then the pandemic hit and we realized, oh, there's 20 million Americans that don't have adequate Wi-Fi access at home. And now that everyone's learning at home, that's a big problem. So that, that's an example of setting new goals that it's not good enough just to have access at school, that you really do need access at home for anywhere, anytime learning in, in secondary and post-secondary. There are many um, examples of, of really great technology enhanced education. I, you know, I, I had the opportunity to be one, lead one of the first one-to-one -one school districts in the country, and my my own daughters benefited tremendously from really thoughtful teachers that did a beautiful job of integrating technology into their education in in the in the nineties. And uh, the school districts that were the school districts and universities that had a, a thoughtful blended learning, personalized learning program were were very quickly able to flip. Uh, into remote learning and operated a, at a very high level uh, that has continued to this day. But it it um, it definitely uncovered the fact that most K twelve systems and most universities were woefully um, underprepared, and even those that had adopted. Um, platforms and, and primarily digital curriculum, um, for the most part, we're not ready for the shift. So it was sort of a disappointing answer, um, but I, I think spotty examples of success, but overall, I think we've, we, uh, we, we've wasted a lot of money and um, just haven't seen the results hoped for. It, it, one last quick thing on this, Ian, it's interesting to note that, that if you look at the last 30 years, we had three really interesting meta trends under what we had standards based reform, which is the idea that if you can push top down, what kids should know and be able to do and standardized testing and strong accountability, that things would become better and more equitable. That didn't work. And we had ed tech, um, and we had the explosion of new school development, uh, not just in charter schools, but also in public schools, some in private schools. But, you know, we saw 12, 13,000 new schools um, in, in the last couple of decades. And those three trends of new schools and, and new tech um, and new standards sometimes collaborated in useful ways, but a lot of times 
were were sort of at odds and and competed with each other. And I I think to some extent the standards movement um, dampened um, and diverted productive uses of technology. So I think that's one of the reasons that things didn't work out as uh, quite as as well, at least as progressively as as we hoped. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I think your answer is actually quite good. You said it was a disappointing answer, but I, I feel that it was actually a very valuable answer because it's one that I didn't expect. Uh, you know, I, the thing that, I, that came to mind as you were describing the the results of learning in math and science uh, with regards to ed tech, uh, it made me think of language and how we learn languages through like Duolingo and these great apps. And so we're learning at a faster rate, perhaps than when we were in school. Um, also right. thinking about, you know, practices like mental fitness or meditation kind of um, more on the personal development side. Are we learning faster in ed tech? So kind of the non-standard things or, or, or um, skills and attributes that are, aren't maybe typically measured. Maybe there's some advances there. And then the other thing that sprang to mind is, as you were describing this is maybe the return on investment, even though we're moving this proverbial goalpost further and further, maybe that is a sign that we're actually learning along with the technology. So the technology in a way, the example I like to give is during the pandemic, when people did go home and they did have to figure out how to get on Wi-Fi and they did have to learn how to deliver the same course to a student on their phone, that that forced all of us to learn yeah. in a way and prepare us for technology or, or maybe those career outcomes that are available today. So maybe just by virtue of technology's advancement or ed tech's te- um, advancement, maybe we're learning as a virtue of that or as an outcome of that um, in a more you know, indirect way. I'm sure that's true. And Ian, we, we could also, um, I think we could point to some of the benefits of, uh, of gaming that uh, accelerated during the pandemic. You know, I, I think something like two thirds of Americans, at least occasionally are playing video games and certainly most kids do. And um, there's some reason that scores of aggregate intelligence keep going up. And, you know, if, if, if our aggregate use of ed tech in schools isn't what we hope, there's some reason that uh, we seem to be getting smarter as a, as a species. And I, I think there's some benefits to um, some of the, the mental agility that's exercised through uh, increased uh, gaming that happens online. So I agree. There, there's access to a lot of... Um, useful learning and learning adjacent activities online. We do, we do have to admit that social media, I think has largely gone off the rails as, as a productive activity. You know, in 2010, I was a social media optimist and I, I thought that, that we'd all sort of level up and have a more civic discourse, uh, civil discourse, um, around a shared fact base and um, almost the, the exact opposite happened as, as, as businesses chose advertising as the business model and focused on attention harvesting uh, as their uh, primary delivery strategy. I think we've created, uh, I think it's pretty clear that we've created a mental health crisis in America that's going to be hard to fix. Um, and so while some of this out of school um, computer and phone usage has, has been productive, I think we're seeing dangerous levels of addiction um, with associated mental health challenges. And, you know, we see places like Montana trying to ban TikTok and that doesn't seem like the right answer, but um, we we certainly haven't developed a, a useful solution to this issue. And and on the subject of generative AI, we're just 
way out over our skis <laughs> with a set of <laughs> products that are way ahead of public dialogue about um, any of the legal or ethical, uh, moral or uh, mental health issues associated with their use. Yeah, well, that all of that could be a topic for our next <laughs> discussion. Th this has been really fascinating. We could continue for we could do the uh, the three hour podcast if if we wanted to. But thank you for for ending on that note. Is there is there anything else you want to leave the listeners with? Um, well, an another thing we, we uh, didn't touch on is that we're launching a, an initiative next month uh, uh, to support new micro schools. So we, we've raised a fund uh, to help um, families and, uh, and school operators develop new small schools around um, this new pathways idea of new, new learning models um, attached to uh, opportunity in, in new ways. So that might be another interesting future conversation. Um, yeah, let's like, get that again, uh, where, where can someone find more, find out more about uh, micro schools and, and yeah, this just, new facet? Just uh, check out gettingsmart.com. Uh, we'll, we'll make, uh, we have a lot of micro school resources on the site and we'll be making uh, an announcement and uh, make some grant opportunities available to folks in the near future. We'd love to have many of those models, you know, linked to higher education opportunity. We hope a number of those are uh, accelerated pathways in some, in some respects. So, and as we discussed earlier, we'd love to hear from folks that are working on new learning models in secondary or post-secondary education, new ways to engage people in meaningful work linked to opportunity. Um, Shoot me a note at Tom at Getting Smart, or you can find me on, I'm still on the Twitter machine for, for the time being. So uh, reach out and uh, I'd love to, to learn more about what your uh, listeners are doing to innovate for equity. That sounds good, Tom. Thank you for your time today. You've given us a lot to think about and a lot to, uh, to reach out and follow up on. Much obliged. Thanks, Ian.